Okay, then hello everybody, and I guess if everybody's seated, then I guess we can start. Um, so my name is Felix Hüttner. I want to talk today about a little bit of OBN and running it and scale and uh, burning it not only once, but actually quite a lot of times. Um, just to give you a short overview of what we are actually currently running. We are running an uh, OpenStack environment with uh, 550 hypervisors at the moment. Another one that's not running OVN yet, um, where we will steal a few more hypervisors from in the future. Um, all of these are supported by nine network or gateway nodes, depending on how you want to name them, that actually host all the external traffic of uh, OVN. So we are not using some kind of DVR uh, setup, but we are centralizing all ingress and egress traffic for floating IPs and external networks. All of that is running on OpenStack Yoga and uh, OVN 2212, which is quite recent, so was released just last December, um, and OVS 3.1, which I think is the latest release that's actually there. A little bit of overview for the workload. Um, it's uh, currently just 6,000 uh, 6, for VMs. Um, yeah, as I know the description said it's over 1,000, but it's not over 1,000. Um, yeah, a few thousand networks, a few thousand routers, Actually, 16,000 ports. We were quite confused when we actually saw the number ourselves. Uh, but there's a lot of ports into all of these uh, networks for metadata, for router ports, uh, multiple ones. Um, actually, quite a lot of security groups and security group rules. A lot of these also referencing each other. Um, and what we measured as, as peak currently was 15 gigabits of external uh, traffic running through these nine network nodes. So I want to give you a, a short overview of the architecture of a, actually our uh, OVN, our Neutron setup, um, just to, to have a, a little bit of the feel of, of what I want to talk about now. Um, new, the Neutron API actually connects to the northbound database of OVN. The northbound database of OVN is basically the OVN representation of what we have in Neutron. So it's uh, basically a translation layer. Uh, there's also the definition of switches, which is networks, there's routers um, and ports and all, all of the things that you all know just in a different representation so that OVN can work with it and we are then, let's say, OpenStack agnostic. Um, the next part is NorthD. NorthD is then a translation layer. Uh, it translates from the high-level description of I am a router, I am a switch, I have a virtual port, for example, that runs KeepAlifeD and translates that into flows and port bindings. These are then stored in the Southbound database. So the Southbound database is a quite bit lower level representation and uh, it's actually the main translation layer that OVN is actually having. Below the Southbound database, there's relays. Uh, relays, you are basically saving your Southbound from dying all the time. We tried it without relays. Um, doesn't end too well if you have a lot of client connections. What the relays actually do is they hold a replica of the Southbound database data, so clients can ask the relays instead of the Southbound database. So it's basically distributing load and distributing client queries, which are the main cause of issues for the databases. And then on each hypervisor or on each network node, you see the OVN controller. OVN controller then talks to the Southbound database. He's like, this is a representation of what I need to install now and translates to the even lower level implementation that's running then in OpenV switch stored in the very local OVSDB. That's then talking to the kernel to actually install flows and to actually process packets. So we have a lot of translation layers that go from very abstract concepts like routers and switches to very detailed flows and very, uh, very detailed implementations. There's also the OVN metadata agent that uh, hosts the metadata service uh, that all the VMs consume for cloud init, which was for OVS previously centralized with uh, at the L3 or DHCP agents, but is now actually distributed and running on each individual compute node. And just to make it easier for everybody, I wanted to have a short dictionary regarding Neutron and OVN because the naming are quite a little bit different. For example, networks are logical switches. Subnets actually don't have a representation in OVN at all. They are represented by IPs existing with, uh, with different configuration at different locations. Um, but there's no subnet resource in itself. Routers are routers. Ports are actually 
uh, distributed between switch ports and router ports, um, although you normally can easily find a one-to-one -one representation. And security groups and security group rules are translated to a quite similar equivalent. So I'm not sure if everybody has actually had a chance to take a look at flows and what OBN is doing there, but let's take a look at a flow. Um, this is taken from the Southbound database and it's the very, very rough version of what a router does. Um, you see the individual tables in here. Um, OpenFlow or the flow diff idea itself uses different tables. Your packet comes in at the table zero and is matched according to a set of rules. And whatever rule it matches, this action will take, uh, will take action and there might be the next action which says go to the next table. Or, jump to a different table or something like that. So the very first uh, table is actually things you all normally have in your network interface, uh, which just says, if I get a packet, is it actually sent to my MAC address or is it sent to somewhere else? If it's not sent to my MAC address, I can completely drop it because it's most probably not something I can actually do anything about. Um, and then we jump, uh, if this condition does hold, we actually jump to the next table. Um, I skipped a few or quite a lot of these tables because there's a lot of magic happening for very different things like uh, fragmentation of packets, like load balancing, like up uh, lookups and stuff like that. And I just wanted to keep it a lot simpler. So we then jump to table three. Table three is doing the very first uh, check regarding routing. So for example, if our time to live of the IP packet is uh, too low, we send a time to live exceeded and we can stop the processing there because we don't actually care what's going on there. Also, if we actually receive a ping, we can answer here. So the ping actually doesn't go through the routing pipeline. It's actually stopped very early in the routing pipeline process. Um, all other packets just continue. Um, and then table 13, table 17 are actually doing both uh, the whole routing magic. Table 13 is saying like, this IP address that is the destination IP, is it one of the destination IPs of another interface where it's uh, then the one it's coming in? If yes, I can decrement the time to live, I can change the source MAC address, and I can set a port where I want to send the thing out. Um, if it gets sent to some IP where I have no idea where to send it to, I just drop the packet because I can't do anything about it. And table 17 is then actually the outlook up for the destination. So um, I need to see what's the destination IP. Is it a next top router? Do I need to look up uh, the IP or the MAC address of the router I need to send it now to? Or do I need to look up the MAC address of, for example, a VM or something like that? I look it up, I send it to my, set it to my packet. If I don't know it, I send an op request, which is not nice because then actually I drop the packet. I just send an op request and we'll learn this for later. So I hope the source will send another packet. And for the next round, I then hopefully have an answer to this op request and can then actually forward this packet. <coughs> and you would think it might work without issues, but I guess we all know that that's not how it's happening. Um, there's a lot and a lot of different and probably quite detailed issues that we uh, saw some are fixed. I will go to a, a little bit more detailed over them later. Some are not fixed actually, or are not easy to fix because they are more issue on a maybe conceptual level. Um, one thing is router distribution during failover. That's something we, we saw just recently, which basically causes routers to pile up on single network nodes and the other network nodes going quite empty. Causing, all, causing this one network node to basically process all of the traffic. One of the main issues that we saw is OBSDB server clusters that are not too stable or not too healthy. Um, all, of the, all of the OBN implementation is basically a single threaded solution or multiple single threaded solutions. So you can quite easily overload your OBSDB server so it doesn't answer heartbeats reasonably enough for all other nodes. So the other nodes think it's down, they vote for a new leader of their cluster and the cluster breaks apart a little bit. Um, that's not nice. Um, OVN controllers also take a few seconds to reconcile, so there is some incremental logic, so if there's a change, they try to recompute only a little bit of information, but there are some things where they actually need to recompute all of the logic they have in them and that can take a few seconds. Most of the time, that's not a big of 
issue, but for example, Kiebel IFD failovers need such a recompute. And if I then need to wait like three or four seconds, then my Kiebel IFD failover might happen fast in the VM, but from a network perspective, it's delayed by a few seconds. Um, and what we saw also is a lot of edge cases regarding SSL connections in the OVSDB clients. So we are using TLS connections everywhere, but there's some error handling in very weird edge cases that we saw. Um, what we also found is actually a kernel bug in the Linux kernel, um, where you could kill the entire system if you delete a network namespace. Um, I'll show you that at the end. Um, and what's also there is a MAC binding table. So I, I told you earlier, OVN sends ARP request it if it doesn't know the MAC address, the de or the destination MAC address for a given packet. These are then stored in the MAC binding table in the Southbound database, and they per default don't have a time to live. They just stay there until the router that owns them is, is deleted. So we quite easily went up to like 500,000 entries into in that table, and we couldn't get rid of them easily. There's a feature called MAC binding aging, where this is a, entries are removed after a given time, but they are not actively renewed. So the MAC binding is actually deleted. The next packet that comes in triggers a new ARP request, but the packet itself is dropped again. So you have a traffic outage. That's something that's actually actively worked on upstream to get rid of this uh, not so ideal behavior. So all of that now sounded, let's say, not that great, but let's compare it to the OBS uh, ML2 plugin. And I'll do that in a, in a few different topics. Let's take a look at maintenance. Um, we previously had issues regarding restarting of L3 agents because if they restart, they need to synchronize and create network namespaces, keep alive the processes and all of that stuff, which at least for us took 45 to 60 minutes. You need to take that number with quite a bit of care because that's our environment that's running OpenStack Queens. So I guess there are some improvements, but I guess we are not getting to the point of OVN where we are quite consistently below a minute. Um, HA routers, I guess you probably all know that, that pain are using KeepLFD for failover. You have the DHCP agents that use the DNS mask processes. So your network nodes have quite a few processes if you have a lot of routers. Um, that's quite nice in OVN because it's all flows. So you don't have the issue that you have thousands of processes running on that system that might need CPU time at exactly the same issue, or the, exactly the same time. Um, and failover on OVN is handled using BFD, so we're a lot more, from our feeling, precise there. Um, and for, for us, the now stable logic for OBS was we migrate all agents away from the L3 or DHCP agent. So all routers go to it, are manually rescheduled to another node, DHCP or DHCP namespaces are manually rescheduled somewhere else, and then we stop the agents because then nothing bad can happen anymore. For OVN, we can just stop the OVN controller because that healthily stops these things and doesn't actually burn the whole environment. If you take a look at what happens at overload, so if you have a network node and it processes more traffic than it can handle, it needs more CPU time than it has or something like that. Um, for OBS, we, ha we had it a few times and uh, we spent a few hours on recovery each time um, because if one of the network nodes gets overloaded, it stops answering to keep alive D randomly. And other network nodes then take over these uh, Kiebel FD processes, they get masters. But this one node isn't consistently dead. So it sends some requests out or some VRP announcements out as well. And these Kiebel FD processes start to flap. So one node can easily bring down other ones just with the load of Kiebel FD failover all the time. For OVN, we have never observed such an issue like that. So a node might fail, but then this one node fails. Um, you can try to reschedule routers to other nodes, so maybe you can isolate the issue or something like that. Um, but we don't cascade the failure to somewhere else. And if we take a look at control plane outages, that looks currently a little bit like uh, if it's completely down, the ML2 OBS looks a little more stable, but if that's actually the case, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, both of them obviously prevent updates. If the control plane is down, nothing you can change anything. 
what is still working in OVS is keep the failover of KeepAlive-D if the user has KeepAlive-D instances. That doesn't work in OVN, at least for cases where KeepAlive or the packets to that KeepAlive-D IP go over a router because that needs the control plane for updates. Um, but we don't have that issue regarding things going out of sync that maybe you also saw for ML2 OVS, where just randomly a given agent doesn't know the network nodes it needs to send traffic to or broadcast packets to or whatever else, and which randomly fixes itself after some time. So let's go into a little bit more detailed thing of what actually broke. Um, one thing that we saw quite early, if you just restart an OVN controller, it takes a little bit of time, or quite a long time, until the Neutron API actually sees it as up. Um, that's a, that's a fix that's already merged because that was, uh, that was just a missing, let's say, notification there. Um, we saw quite a lot of issues with the OVN metadata agent. If you have a lot of, re or a lot of ports it needs to monitor, because it basically asks the softbound database for all ports. Not only the ports of the node it's currently running on, but all ports. And since it's maybe not the most uh, performant Python implementation of the world, um, it might take like a few minutes or uh, a long time to actually start up. Um, we use monitoring conditions now for that, so we just ask the Southbound database for the port on the local node, because we don't care about anything else. Um, the thing I mentioned earlier regarding uh, OVN routers are not load balanced when failing over to, others, uh, to other nodes. Um, we're still taking a look at that, and there's uh, some issue regarding neutron bumping revision numbers. So neutron thinking some port in OVN is out of sync with the neutron database, and it resynchronizes that every five minutes and then still thinks it's out of sync. Um, but since that's just for virtual ports, it doesn't hurt us that much. As you can see, OVN broke more. Um, for example, uh, one thing that's also already fixed is uh, IPv6 failover for external IPs because there was no announcement. So GOPs were not sent, so physical switches didn't know they now need to send traffic to a different uh, physical switch port. Um, if you want to use that, uh, OVN 2212, uh, that, that, that fix is included. Um, a few fixes for the Python OVSDB package regarding handling of broken connections, uh, where we could easily get to 100% of CPU time trying to reconnect on a socket that's actually closed. Um, one thing that was actually a denial of service from the outside was a package to a router port, to the to an outside router port, if, you, uh, if it's TCP SYN, was actually resubmitted. So the router tried to route a packet to itself and decremented the TTL and tried to route it to itself, decremented the TTL and did that until the TTL expired. Um, and this just causes a lot of load on OVN because it doesn't know it can just drop the packet, it needs to process it. Um, the recalculation of OVN controller in Northy, that's uh, I guess a constant struggle there just because single threaded processes and Northy currently doesn't have some incremental sync that's literally now being implemented. Um, so changes can just take a long time to propagate, which is especially annoying for failover of keep alive of user instances. Otherwise, you don't notice it too much. Next thing is OVSDB cluster stability. I'll give you a, sh uh, a few tips for that uh, right after the slide. Um, and what's also quite ugly is there's a resubmit limit in OVS. So if OVS needs to do too many actions and packets are processed win too many actions, um, then OBS is actually dropping the packet because it just can't handle it and wants to prevent an infinite loop there. Um, that's also quite a performance hit if OVN or OBS actually needs to do that all the time for each individual packet. And that's uh, there we need to actually take a look at each individual instance of that and determine appropriate behavior. So if you now want to run an OVN at scale, um, that's Take, let's take a look at the northbound database there. You see the, the three uh, northbound <laughs> cluster members, so OBSDB is using a raft cluster for that, um, which works quite nice. And what you have one leader in this raft cluster, you have two followers. One thing to do is, if you want to take backups, don't take the backup at the leader, 
because that leader needs to process all writes and it needs to uh, write a snapshot before you can trigger backup, which is not that great because it then fails over. Um, if you want to use TLS, which I can strongly recommend, is don't do TLS in OVSDB. So put some kind of reverse proxy in front that's terminating the TLS connection just to get the load down even further. So all we want to do here is reduce load on the OVSDBs. And the Neutron API or Naughty can then talk to that TLS uh, termination processes, so some kind of reverse proxy, and uh, then use that to talk to the northbound database. For the southbound, it actually makes sense to go even further. <coughs> You have the, the bottom part, which is actually the same as before, but only North D connects there. And at the top, you see relays. Relays in OVVN are the idea to replicate the content of the database and to just serve read requests while forwarding write requests. Most of part of the OVN deployment are read requests, so you can qu get quite substantial benefits from them. Um, and don't just go with one or two relays. Go with a lot of relays. Relays are cheap. They, worst case, consume one CPU core, they consume maybe one or two gigabytes of memory. So we, for example, in our production environment, run 24 of these. Just, it's there, use it. Um, and point everything that's not North D to these. So Neutron API OVN controller, the OVN metadata agent, actually maybe not yet Neutron API because it doesn't work, um, but there's a patch for that that makes it work. Um, a lot of uh, client libraries actually try to connect to the leader of the raft cluster, either explicitly or because they forgot to, to actually say, I can connect to anything. And yeah, that breaks relays because relays are never leader of the raft cluster. Um, regarding timeouts, OVN has a lot of timeout settings between the different processes. Set them to large numbers, like one or two minutes is a seemingly completely fine value. It doesn't feel good from my perspective, uh, but there's some improvements that are needed in order to actually reliably set them to lower values. Otherwise, you have random things that are disconnecting and that doesn't help availability either. Um, regarding versions, there are some LTS releases. I'm not sure why they exist. The amount of benefits and the amount of changes and performance gains in your versions are so large, don't use LTS. Um, there are two things if you are on an external network where other consumers or other people or whatever, somebody else is actually active. Because OVN tries to do a lot of things. Um, for example, if you get GRP packets from the outside because of some kind of failover, but you actually don't care about these, which might be a lot of cases because maybe the MAC address doesn't even change, it just propagates a new port. And you, from an OVN perspective, just say it's this one port. It doesn't change too much. It's just relevant for maybe the physical switch infrastructure in between. Then there's a new setting regarding broadcast ops to our routers. You can disable that. Then OVN will just drop these packets instead of trying to send it to more routers than it can actually handle. Because that's one of these instances where we reach that resubmit limit. Um, and also, if you have a bunch of hosts outside there, then set this MAC binding age threshold so that the MAC binding table is clipped. Otherwise, also, you will end up with a gigantic amount of MAC bindings that will never expire. If they are st all static in your environment, then there's no benefit in setting the setting. But if they are a little volatile, then I guess there's a lot of benefit in getting rid of these. OK, and I promised the kernel bug. There's a kernel bug. Um, we actually uh, had an issue in the startup script of our metadata agent. So what we did is, uh, or let's take a short look first how the whole thing works. You have a VM on a host. That VM has a tap device in the main network namespace of the host, which is then connected to the, uh, to the virtual port of that VM. The tap device is connected to OBS. Also for the metadata agent, there's a VETH pair. One of that is in the main network namespace, another one is in the metadata network namespace where an HA proxy and all that magic runs. Um, and if the VM now sends a packet to the metadata agent, it goes through the kernel, ideally, because it's the, the accelerated data path. What we observed is if you delete that metadata agent network namespace, 
not the port, not the HA proxy process, but really the namespace while it's still active. And the VM in the exact same time sends a packet to there, you can get a kernel to hang. Because the kernel tr then tries to send a packet to a V8H port that actually doesn't exist anymore, or is in the process of being decommissioned. And there's a nice uh, infinite loop that can trigger in that case, basically bringing your ho host down because a lot of processes depend on this, on things they're actually finishing. Um, there's a fix for that in kernel 6.1 or newer that we built. Um, okay, and that's it from my side. Are there any questions? currently in the process of building our upgrade path for OVN. We have not tried it yet. <laughs> so I guess that's a session for the next summit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, we started that with yoga. Um, and probably would now go for a newer OpenStack version since that's already there. Yeah, there's, a, there's some incompatible changes that might happen between the OER Northbound and Neutron that both sides need to be aware about. And so it makes sense to be quite current with both of these. There was a question back there, but I don't know from whom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are currently taking a look at offloading that work from the service by the, basically by doing hardware offloading on the network card um, to push these flows from OBS and from the kernel uh, data path to the network card. But with uh, bonding and VLANs and stuff like that on that, um, like documentation doesn't exist. And uh, if you want to ask no more, ask Luca back there. <laughs> <laughs> or question. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it that if you use uh, a few central nodes and not the two different sets of GPUs? Um, we used it also in the past with OBS, so, so we didn't want to uh, take a closer look at that again, but maybe that makes sense with using BGP, but we wanted to keep all this, let's say, external connectivity, the multiple external networks we have just to a few locations so that these few locations get all the, let's say, horribleness of stretched layer two networks and all that fun stuff, while the, all the other nodes are fine and don't need to care about that issue. So we wanted to centralize the problem. Mm, what we do if we do maintenance on a compute node is we completely evacuate all VMs from that before that, and afterwards you can quite easily stop the OVN controller. There's n nothing that I know of that you need to take special action on. Um, they, what we found interesting is there's upcall statistics from OBS. So OBS has an internal metrics tracker where it tracks various things that are happening. That's sometimes quite a good indication what it tries to do if, if it doesn't respond. Um, otherwise, taking a look at mega flows, taking a look at what packets are actually hitting the kernel space, what are packets are hitting the user space, that's quite interesting because if you see a lot of packets hitting the user space, that can quite easily overwhelm the open vSwitch on the user space side and therefore also overwhelm the kernel side. The kernel will then start dropping packets. Um, 
yeah, that's that's one of the bigger issues. So what we see is that around 99% of all packets are handled in the kernel. If that goes like below 95%, you have no chance to actually handle these packets in user space. Currently, it's also rather experience. You can, um, you have these messages regarding uh, it, it exceeds the, the planned time of a second for, for such a grid computation. And if it exceeds that regularly, then I, I, would use, I would use that value and give it a lot of buffer on top of it, maybe double or triple it, and use that as a timeout value. Um, one thing that I also heard, but it's, that was yesterday in another session, um, there's the neutron agent heartbeat. Uh, set this to a large value because that triggers just a lot of changes on the OVN side. Um, we said, already said it before we started that whole OVN endeavor to one hour and we just copied that setting and gladly we did. If there are no more questions, then I guess we are done. Thanks very much.